Hi, I'm Gary Brown from Hatcher Advisory. I'm a chartered accountant, entrepreneur, and I love doing business. Today, I've got the pleasure to be working on this podcast with Online Prosperity, and it's going to be an amazing 20-minute segment on it, on business, on money, and wealth creation. Stay tuned, guys. Now, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today, I've brought you Gary Brown, a chartered accountant who holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree with a major focus on accounting and finance. Now, Gary, welcome to the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. I appreciate been, the invite. Absolutely. I've been looking at your website, Gary, and I've noticed that you've supported hundreds of businesses to make better financial decisions through targeted education and future focused goal setting. Now, this is one thing that eludes a lot of businesses, which is financial education. Tell us a little bit about your business and sort of how you actually took this path, which is a non-conventional, um, you know, accounting path that other um, uh, firms have taken. Yeah. Look, we, we started an accounting business seven, eight years ago, um, my wife and I, but she wasn't my wife at the time. And we looked at the the market and what we thought was lacking for the small business owners and no disrespect to any of the accounting firms that I previously worked for, because some of them were amazing, but we just identified that there was a gap in the market with that really, you know, working in a partnership with the client rather than compliance and uh, only dealing with them, you know, once a year. So we wanted to build strong relationships with the people that we work with and, with that, we go about, you know, helping them grow their businesses. And when you look at helping someone grow their business, you need to have something to measure it against. You need to, you know, have some goals to aspire to, whether it is to create a freedom business, whether it is to sell a business, uh, or maybe you just want to take your business from, you know, $100,000 worth of revenue to $500,000. We need to have something and that's where the goal settings comes into it. So that was our method and, and you know, a lot of we probably 300 we probably helped close to a thousand um individuals over the years maybe maybe two thousand individuals over the years um and right now we have around 600 uh business group clients at the moment absolutely that's massive growth and congratulations on obviously um you know the growth of the business and also on a personal note you ended up marrying um your work colleague right yeah. there <laughs> yeah that's a that's an interesting story um she's not here to comment so i would say that she um she 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 went after me and she might say that i went after her i don't know but she's not here to defend herself so she definitely went after me absolutely that's jenny right that's jenny yes all right jenny if you're listening you have every right to ring uh, ring me up and i'll tell you everything i've been told um, about this story. Now, obviously, Gary, with what you've just mentioned, how you are working with about 600 businesses and also in the process, helping them set their goals and educating them in the process. Um, I've read somewhere that your clients are describing you as transformational and a true partner. Why did you take this route, especially um, you know, working with people or businesses when other accountants are just there for the compliance part and just helping people submit their BAS or their GST, um, you know, paperwork. I think it goes back down to that financial literacy and understanding your numbers. So one of my missions in life is to teach financial literacy and to help people to expand their knowledge there because I think we don't have enough uh, education at you know high school um high school universities in that sense that would do it that do it in the real business sense so because of that i looked at again all all the friends and families that i have they were my role models um you know growing up and i look at why did some of them succeed in business and why did some of them fail and we had some you know family members that you know unfortunately didn't do too well in business and I go back to that and go, well, what 
should they have done differently if they knew, um, if they had the right information at the time, what could they have done differently? And then I go back to it. Well, who was there to help support them? Because an accountant is someone that is really, really good at understanding financial numbers. But there's no point having an accountant on your team if he's talking about 2021 financial year and we're now in 2023. There's no relevance. That that year is 18 months ago. I can't make a, a sound business decision based on what someone's telling me on data that's 18 months old. I can barely make a sound business decision on the data that someone's telling me from three months ago, let alone 18 months ago. So the traditional accounting model where you're, you know, helping a client do their tax returns and it's 12 months past, you know, the year's finished, it's been 12 months. You're just helping them tick a box with the ATO. You're not actually helping them to make better financial decisions. And because they don't get the real-time data or they're not using the real-time data with their expert, they're not making the best decisions that they could possibly make. The difference here could be uh, today I was on a, a Zoom meeting um, with one of my clients and more to one of my brand new clients and they've just done a purchase and the purchase was for some equipment and the interest rate they're paying is 20%. And I was like, oh no. And straight away I was like, did you speak to the previous accountant at this point? And they said, yes. And the previous accountant said, oh, it's all a tax deduction. And I'm like, well, they're correct. It is a tax deduction, but we could have got the equipment if we, you know, played the game a bit better, you know, around 12, 13%. And that means that we would have that savings in interest, which means we don't need a tax deduction for it because we're not paying it in the first place. But I would prefer the money to be in the client's bank account instead of the bank, uh, the bank's bank account. So making better informed decisions, you need to have up-to-date information and you need the accountant who in theory is really good at numbers to be helping you along the way, not historical. You want them today. Absolutely. That is actually very useful, especially in today's age where inflation is moving faster than the speed of sound and you want to be making financial decisions on the fly and you know if you've got a somebody who's well vested um you know with your best interest and not just somebody who's going to be ticking a, an ato box um this is somebody that you would want in your corner now i would suppose in you trying to educate people um you know you come across a lot of these false beliefs around money which often rob people of their opportunity yeah. to maybe buy their first home or start a family, just predicated yeah. on the fact that they just think money is evil and they don't want to spend more than two minutes discussing money, um, you know, even yeah. if it's to save their own bottom line. How do you navigate that whole, um, you know, barrier where false beliefs are really prominent in, you know, in our society today? Yeah, um, I think about them as being money stories. So, you know, everyone everyone would have different money stories and some of them would serve you and some of them wouldn't be serving you. And I think about my money stories or the beliefs that I have from growing up and everything that I saw. And I always believed that I wanted to be a millionaire. I didn't know when I was seven how that was going to happen, but I believed that I wanted it. And I believe that much, um, I'd like to say it was easy. I believe that much that I became a millionaire, but obviously a little bit of hard work went into it. A lot of hard work went into it. But I think about the stories that helped me to achieve that. And I'm one of seven. So there is six other siblings out there that had a similar upbringing to me, not all the same, obviously, but a similar one. And I look at the journeys that each of those siblings of mine have taken and their money stories are different. Their money beliefs are completely different to mine. And I find that really fascinating. So I go back to when I'm having challenges with clients or people on this topic, I go back to try to understand why and, and I ask probing questions about it. But at, at a certain point, I go back to this is where if it's impacting someone's life to buying a house, growing their business, um, buying investment properties, uh, becoming 
too successful, so they'll self self sabotage. Then I go back to look. We may need to. You may need to do some work on this and do some self education and speak to someone who's more experienced at dealing with these type of stories. Um, because again, some of them won't be serving people. And the big one that I hear all the time, and I kind of it frustrates me a lot when I hear it. Someone will be on income of you know one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. And they'll say there's no point earning any more money because I'm going to be paying, you know, 40 cents in the dollar in tax. And then I look at that and go, but if you weren't that extra 20K, 30K, 40K, whatever it may be, what we're talking about, but if you weren't that extra money and you paid the tax and we took that money, the, the extra bit, and we invested it in property and shares in another business, whatever it may be, and we did that long enough, that would compound to a large sum of money. And that large sum of money could be the difference between you retiring with $500,000, retiring with a million dollars, retiring with $10 million. So they're the ones that frustrate me the most, those type of stories where people don't want to earn more income because they don't want to pay a higher tax bracket of income. Um, and they're the ones that are not serving people the most. And they're the ones that I come across uh, most, most frequently. Absolutely. Well, there's always war stories that are spoken about at dinner tables. And there's always <laughs> Auntie Sally who's, who knows everyone that has gone through any monetary uh, problem that uh, might ensue. You did mention something that is a very big issue, especially for business people that are creating a business that is going to be profitable and also enjoyable. The fear of success. How are business people actually uh, sabotaging themselves, you know, when it actually comes to, um, you know, creating wealth for themselves, which obviously yeah. would sustain them? I think... This goes back to an Australian culture. Um, and in, in, in Australia, we, for whatever reason, we like to, you know, cut down the tall poppy syndrome. We have that, you know, we don't want, we want people to succeed, but we don't want them to succeed too much. You can do well, but not too well. You know, that guy who's driving that red Ferrari, wherever it is, um, I can't see any, but, you know, that guy driving that red Ferrari, he must have ripped off someone or he must, he must be a jerk. And the reality of that type of culture means that when an everyday person is doing well in business or in their professional career, when they're doing well in whatever they're trying to succeed at, they get to a certain point where they go, you know what, subconsciously, this is enough. I've got enough. And then they might ease off. The, they may, may take their foot off the, the pedal. They may stop working as hard. They may not invest, continue to invest in themselves or in the team. And we notice that from the clients that I work with, there's different reasons that we see this happen. But we watch the trajectory of a business owner go from making $100,000 in profit to 200 to 500 to a million. And then once they get up to that million dollar mark, there's either two, one or two things will end up happening. They will, they normally then go, this is enough. That million dollar number is enough. And then they'll say, we'll maintain it, but they never maintain it. It goes to drop straight back down. Cause as soon as they try to maintain it, things go wrong and they drop back down to maybe three or 400,000 or they say it's not enough. And when they say it's not enough and they keep going, they keep trying to grow the business, employ more people, you know, do better at business, then then the sky's the limit. But the ones that self-sabotage because they're like, this is enough, when they they just instinctively believe that they have to work harder to generate more money. But we have so many clients and I've worked with so many people over the years that make a lot of money, but they then able to choose what they do in their business. They choose what part of the business they like to do. So just because they're now able to make more money and grow their business. They don't have to continue to work on the tools 70 hours a week. So they make those choices. The ones that are self-sabotaging are, and a tradie is a really good example. You've got a qualified tradie who's 
you know, got maybe two or three apprentices below them. And each day that they are working on the tools with their hands, building something, um, they end up self-sabotaging because they're not going to get past the next step. They've got to employ a qualified person. They've got to employ two qualified people. They've got to get off the tools. And you and we watch them fall back into the, you know, on the tools, off the tools, and they're always going back around and around and around in a circle. It ends up being a self-sabotage for them to get past that and always be off the tools because they get they bring themselves back into it. Absolutely. I mean, obviously this is, you know, a catch 22, um, you know, egg and chicken sort of story as in, you know, to, to, is it society? Is it the accountants that are not taking their role to actually educate people or are the people actually just self sabotaging? Like you said, it's a cultural yep. norm that, um, you know, everybody shoots the pole, uh, the tall poppy there. Now, yeah. in the sort of world that we live in, I mean, we've been led to believe that financial freedom is not something that you can willfully create in your life. You know, you have to be, I mean, we've been taught that if you're going to be wealthy, it's something that happens to you when you've won the lottery or you've yeah. <laughs> robbed somebody else. But yeah. the transformation that you are taking your clients through is literally people that are coming to you with, maybe a shoebox full of receipts and they walk out of your office um, having bought their first home and studying yep. their sort of family. I mean, I, I really need to understand what switched inside of you personally to think that education is the way to go um, in order for you to actually differentiate yourself in the market of me to, um, you know, um, yep. accountants out there. I think... For me, the, the realization was that you look at every successful business owner ever, ever, and they would have done some form of self-education, improvement, um, investing in them and the team. And you look at the accounting industry and the accounting industry is right now you know, typically run by all the partners of accounting firms are typical, you know, 50, 60 year old people working 70 hours a week. And that doesn't inspire me. So if, if I'm going to start a business and I'm going to look up to, you know, these other businesses in my industry and all of them are, you know, working 70, 80 hours a week and, and, and they might make a lot of money, but they're not living their best life then I have to find a different way to do it. So way I looked at it was, was if all these other industries can do this really, really well and they can create successful businesses and have the life they want to have and not have to, you know, not have to work 70, 80 hours a week, then why can't accounting? So for that, I had to learn myself. I had to change the way that I'd been taught. I had to change my my learnings as an accountant of how to do things from a business perspective. And after I changed and started developing better business acronym, then I realized it's not just me. It is the 2 million other small businesses in Australia that are not also going through this transformational learning um, journey. And out of the top, sorry, out of the first 10 business clients that I took on, um, back seven, eight years ago, I believe probably eight of them are, are still clients. So we have majority of them would still be clients. And some of them have taken their businesses from, you know, $100,000 revenue and are now, you know, four or $5 million in the trade businesses, in um, the medical practices, in trade and medical, probably that's it. And and I look at that and go, some of them have done it where other ones were at the exact same level at the exact same time, had the exact same amount of money, but didn't want to self-improve. And they didn't. And they're just around the same numbers today as what they were seven years ago. So as an accountant, we get to see the financial numbers of every industry, every everyone's business. And we get to if you do it right, you get to take the best aspects of another person's business and apply it to your own business 
And if it works in your business, you can apply to other people's businesses as well. And I think that's what a true, uh, in this case, I'm going to use the word advisor, but that's what the true advisor would do. Whereas an accountant will just give you your tax return and you'll sign it. Oh, absolutely. And it's it's one of those, um, you know, scary documents that you get from your accountant. I don't believe you should be afraid of hearing from your accountant. You should actually be excited that, oh, wait, my money is growing. This is, yes. um, you know, the partnership that's happening. Would you think that you took on this route simply predicated on the fact that everything is now on the cloud? And I'm just looking out here, we're in Melbourne, you know, mm. I don't even know which cloud has all my data okay. i could have shown you <laughs> <laughs> i could have shown well, you well hopefully none that are having data breaches that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and yeah. looking at things <laughs> happening um you know these um these days so i mean what what you're saying is is a really um intriguing and a breath of fresh air for the modern day entrepreneur that's looking to grow their business and actually partner with somebody who's also invested in their growth and is not just, um, you know, trying to remind them of the alphabet soup that comes after their LinkedIn credentials. All right. Now, yeah. if somebody is quite interested in sort of starting to work with you, Gary, what will be the first sort of step that you want to, um, you know, do what you want them to do in order to, sure. to, to get started with you? Yes. Yeah, so on our, on www.hatch.com.au, um, we have a lot of content and you'll see a lot of content on my LinkedIn page as well. So I think the first step is a, is a journey that you personally have to take as a business owner or um, an investor, depending on what you're doing or individual tax returner. The first step you have to take before working with me is actually go on that journey of self-education. See what you actually want. There's no point rocking up in a meeting with me and saying, Gary, I love what you do. Can you be my accountant? And then I actually, well, what do you want from your business? What are you trying to achieve? How can we help you to achieve the goals that you're wanting to have, but you don't have any goals? And obviously we would help and talk about what that means. But I think the first step would be that understanding um, a self-education side of things and wanting to go down that journey. And if you're wanting to go down that journey, then on our website, there is a contact us section and you can fill in your details and I will uh, get in contact with you once you've filled in the details. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, I'll be putting all those, uh, all that information <laughs> right at the bottom there, just so that people get um, to get started i thought maybe you would have wanted people to be a tigers fan before you even started talking <laughs> to them. yeah look um i'm a huge richmond supporter um today i don't have my face painted uh but but other days i have definitely um it does you do win brownie points if you're a richmond supporter i don't really dislike any team but um but i will will hang some grief on you depending on what team you go for that's for sure absolutely and if um you know obviously people are already maybe on the soft um you know education path because i would believe people that are on my uh audience and would people be. that sort of follow the stuff that i'm doing are not just in it um not to sp say for the money but they're in it you know to create a legacy and to actually create impact but you can't create any impact when you're broke all right and we also understand that factor um in there what, what what sort of um advice do you sort of give people that yes maybe they don't necessarily have to come and work with you but what is it that they should look out for especially the next time they have a meeting with their accountant or oh, since we are getting into a new year could it be a new yeah. new look new gym new accountant yeah. Um, you know, so to speak. I would say, um, I would say right now, the biggest, the biggest question you've got to be asking the people, this, the professionals you surround yourself with, whether accountants, lawyers, marketers, whoever it may be, but you've got to ask them, what are they doing in their business? What, like, if I'm going to take advice from an accountant, um, then I want to know that accountant is doing really well in his own business or her business and that they've got their money sorted. Like 
you know, do they have investment properties? If I want to be a property developer, I want to make sure that the people that I'm working with have done developments themselves, right? I don't want to work with an accountant that's never done a property development, but then be my accountant because I don't want them to use the theory that they've learned to do it. I want them to have done it themselves. So they've also got extra tips and tricks. I want the marketing agency that I work with in, in my business, um, shout out to Pixel Palace. I want them to have an amazing brand themselves. If they don't have an amazing brand, why do I want to pay them to make my brand amazing, right? So firstly, I would say like right now, we're in a new financial year. Let's just review who your experts are. You know, who are the people that you're relying on for support and how are they going um, in their businesses? And just, you know, just fact check that a little bit. And then getting more specific around the account. And for me, I want people to come to me and be like, Gary has, you know, done property. He's done shares. He's got a business. He's done a new fit out in his office. So if you ask him any questions about a fit out, he'll know the answers at the moment. Um, you know, I want, I want the accountant to be more knowledgeable than what me, the customer is. That's what, that's what I want. Um, and that's what I think everybody should be striving for and moving away from that transactional value type of, you know, type of relationship. I want the relationship that I have with all the professionals that I work with in my business, I can get on the phone, I can call them up and I don't feel bad if I call them on a sad day. Um, as long as it's not work-related, I wouldn't call them on a sad day, but I can call them up and ask them how their family's going. That's the type of relationship that I want to be building with all my advisors and especially my accountant. Absolutely. And and I, I believe, you know, if you can have a, um, you know, a mutual beneficial relationship with somebody that you're working with, then you know both of you are well, um, you know, vested in either business success. Now, like you yeah. mentioned, it seems like you just don't work with anybody else. And if you're listening and watching this show right now, you know, you want to do your part in, you know, you want to do your part in growing your business as well. And actually, um, you know, making sure that you have invested in your own personal growth. That way, when you do partner with um, Gary and the team at Hatcher Advisory, you also would have, um, you know, clarity within your business that will actually help you transform your business into a thriving venture. And obviously, we all know that that gives you the security you deserve and the freedom you actually crave. Now, Gary, I could go on and on about stuff that's happening in the marketplace right now, how people are, you know, paying more than they should be paying on their you know, tools and everything else. We've yeah. already established that the best way to get in touch with you is, um, you know, using your website, which I will indicate on the bottom, you know, of the website and in the show notes there. Would there be anything else that I sort of, um, you know, jumped just because of my own limiting beliefs, having born, being told that money doesn't grow on trees and things of that nature that I have skimmed and have not yeah. uh, touched on that you might just want to give as a last remark today there, Gary. Oh, absolutely. And thank, thanks for the prompt. I think most people in business that are struggling to put money away and they're living that paycheck to paycheck um, or invoice to invoice or even the wage earners, I think that the first part of being successful from a wealth perspective is to start putting your profit or your wage, a percentage of it away into a separate bank account. So what I would encourage the listeners here to do, even if you are earning you know, $400 a week and you're putting yourself through uni, is to determine the percentage of your profit or your wage and to put that in a separate bank account. And, you know, times were a little bit different when I was at uni, um, when I was at uni 10, 12 years ago. And what I would suggest is that I, I, you know, I was able to hex my university uh, fees and I was 
I chose to have employment. So I chose to work at an iClub. I chose to work at an accounting firm and I made choices that gave me more money in my bank account while I was going to university to pay the bills and to do everything um, because I was living out of home. So I had to. And what I was able to do was between the first, you know, being an adult. So between 18, I think I bought my first property at 23 or 24 is I was able to put a percentage of my, my wages away so that by the time I came out of university, I had some, I had a good amount of money put away. I did my first two years worth of full-time employment. I think I had 30 or 40 K saved up and I bought my first house. Um, obviously I used the bank and I leveraged and, um, Oh, I, I played the wealth creation game and that's that's what I did. But more recently, fast forward to today, more recently I sold it and, you know, I turned 30, 40 grand into 400 grand. So the first step or the best thing to do, regardless of how much money you make, regardless of how much profit you make in the business is even do 1%. It only takes 1%. Even if you put 1% away and you do that for a year and then you revisit it and put another you know 1% or 2% away the following year and you just start doing that mentality you will be able to start building up the money it might be slow but you will be able to do it and once you start getting those wins on the board that's when some really powerful compounding things can happen in life and that's what I'd recommend all the listeners out there to to start doing even if again you're you're struggling week to week you just start with that 1% Absolutely. That is beautiful. And I think it's uh, Mike. I was trying to think of the, the guy who wrote the Profit First book. Yep. And also it is, a, you know, universal financial, um, you know, education staple that you want to pay yourself first. And if you can grow, it's not amount, it's not the amounts that you put away, but it's the act of you actually thinking of yourself first. I mean, the government yep. takes their text first without even asking any questions Correct. and if the people that are taking money away from you are not taking a day off why should you um you know be doing that to yourself now yeah. gary i i noticed there's so much that revolves around um this whole um you know money and creation of wealth um thing i think we should actually create a series and see how we can uh <laughs> debunk yeah, all of these, these mysteries I can't thank you enough for your time, your knowledge, and just, um, you know, your generosity in sitting with us here today. And just even if we haven't really gone into depth um, with money, knowing that whatever advice was given on this show today um, is just of a general nature. So people shouldn't go in and start, you know, <laughs> canceling their subscriptions with their accountants predicated on yep. what they heard on the show today. I absolutely thank you and i'm grateful for the time we've spent together today gary no worries well thank you very much for having me i appreciate it and i would be happy to come back and do some some more episodes on a couple of those topics that we've covered so we can go into a little bit more detail and i can give some more value to the audience because it's what i love to do absolutely thank you so much